I want to speak a little bit about a very basic human sentiment, fear, anxiety. Now, before people are put off, I don't want um, I don't want this to be exactly a negative video. I want it to be more a reflective video. So uh, I don't want it to be all gloom and doom, but I, I do want to just reflect on this because we're in the middle of a killer pandemic. Um, it's already cost over 200,000 lives confirmed and likely a lot more than that. Um, by no means the worst in history. It doesn't even come close to the Black Death or the Spanish flu, for example. But it is proving to be very costly and the social consequences, arguably even the geopolitical consequences, may be uh, the most profound of certainly of my lifetime. And I reckon of um, of many of the people watching this. Um, I mean, I can't think of anything in my life that has had the same sort of effect, certainly in terms of the social implications. Um, you'd really have to go quite far back to find anything comparable. So that gets into this question about fear and anxiety. And the truth is, as human beings, we we could be a lot of things. We could be incredible. We can be incredibly successful. We can be incredibly brave. We can be incredibly despicable at times. You know, the human species is so complex, so contradictory, so diverse and if you've been around long enough if you have I mean I'm 34 I'm not that old I'd like to think I'm still pretty young but I've traveled a fair bit and I've had um, some fairly challenging experiences in my life I always follow that up with a caveat, but not as much as a lot of other people. But more so than some, I would say. Definitely more so than some. Um, I've had experiences with crime, serious experiences with crime, to the point of um, seriously impacting my mental health and confidence, not you know being frightened to leave my own home. I've had more than enough experience of financial anxiety. So those two components, the physical threat of crime, and I'm talking about the sort of crime which involved assault, intimidation, that sort of thing. Um, I'm not just talking like once my bike got stolen, it did actually, but um, no, I mean really the sort of crime that can grind someone down. I experienced that along with my family for almost two years and I don't want to go into deep details because I'm not sure if my family wants that to be discussed on the internet but I used to say it, it was something that I experienced and it's um, something I've never forgotten even though it was 18 years ago now. Um, you know you can't forget something like that. With financial anxiety that's been an on-off thing um, I've struggled with serious depression um, and a lot of that, you know, a lot of the side effect of depression is anxiety because actually suicidal notions, and I'm just saying this bluntly, are quite, um, are quite simple. It's quite simple to think that way, but it's scary because not so much the act in of itself, but sort of telling yourself uh, have I, is it really got this bad that my mindset is in this place by the way just clarify I'm, I'm not feeling like that now i'm not that's not my feelings right now but it's something i have experienced relatively recently four years ago basically at that time things were just going um sort of the second half of 2015 everything just seemed to be going wrong um 
I parted ways with my girlfriend at the time. It was it was a mutual parting, but it, you know, I, I felt that one because I cared deeply about her. Um, and it was there was no animosity, but it just the circumstances worked out in a certain certain way. We just I had to say goodbye to her. That was hard, and there's times I still miss her. Um, but it was very hard then. Our pet dog died. This morning I had a dream about him. So clearly it's still, you know, he was the family dog for over 10 years. Called him Jester. Um, and I, uh, yeah, miss, miss that little guy a lot. He was a kind of a mixed breed, medium sized dog, but mixed breed, kind of mongrel. But, you know, adored family pet. So he died. My bike was stolen. And uh, my social life was starting to wane because the sort of connections I had were just leaving or the club that I went to, the um, things were changing with that. So it just seemed like everything was just going in the wrong direction. And I started getting very, very depressed. And in the beginning of 2016, I was frankly miserable. I just was not happy. I can't say I'm blissfully happy right now, but certainly my frame of mind is better than it was then, overall. Um, but this is the thing with something like depression. It's very, very rare that you have a situation where someone's kind of depressed, then they take time out and they get over it. The vicious thing about depression is it does come and go. So someone with depression, and this is something I think isn't entirely understood, there's this assumption that people who have experienced clinical depression, they must be always miserable, but that's not the case. Someone with clinical depression can have times when they're quite happy, quite content, or at least they are happier than they would usually be. And I'm not talking about bipolar disorder, which are, as I understand it, extremes of emotions. I'm talking about the fact that depression is not constantly like you're miserable. There are times when you feel this is actually quite physically tiring to be constantly miserable. There's times where you feel a bit more okay. But all of this comes down to fear and anxiety of danger in this world and in this life. And so much of that comes from other people. You know, so much of Fear that we experience comes from the actions of others. Now, I don't want to be misunderstood here. This is not about the fact we don't have self-responsibility, because we do. And it's not about blaming other people for our problems, because very often our problems are things that we can sort out ourselves. Um, but the truth is, there are people out there who are selfish. And who really, really don't care how other people feel. And so ex having experienced what I've experienced, I wouldn't say I'm defensive. I wouldn't say I'm on edge. I don't think I am. But I'm perhaps a little bit more assertive about dangers out there. Not in a nutty conspiracy theory sort of way, but just a little bit assertive. That's why I get strong feelings about crime, because I know what it's like. Um, crime causes anxiety. Criminals cause anxiety because they pose a physical threat. You know, if you get some drunk idiot to assault someone for no reason, or they don't need to be drunk, it could be a gang. The, the, the fear of crime is actually a major, major issue. Not necessarily crime itself, that is a major issue, but... The fear of crime. And I think, I'm just going to touch briefly on this, I think that a big part of that is to have reassurance in the justice system and for the police to reassure people as well. You know, that um, criminals will be held to account for hurting other people. That's why I have such strong views on this subject, because I know that that's doesn't just cause a lot of anger, which it does, but it also causes anxiety. You know, serious crime can impact someone's whole life for years afterwards. So, 
there's a lot of situations in this world that are dangerous. It's not just crime. Crime's one of the most obvious ones and one of the most palpable ones. But there's other situations. You could, for example, get into trouble in another country. I don't necessarily mean legal trouble. I mean you could have some sort of misunderstanding. You don't speak the language. Then maybe the locals kind of um, round up on you. That can happen. Uh, nationalism scares me. Extreme nationalism. Um, anywhere. It's a very frightening sort of mindset because it's absolutely, well, any extreme pol political ideology is frightening, actually. Anything that sort of brainwashes people into a cult like mantra for something where they're not capable of even debating another idea. It's one thing having strong political views, and I'd be a hypocrite if I said I didn't. But the thing about something like nationalism, it's incredibly tribal. And if you're an outsider, that can be actually quite intimidating. It can be quite scary. And this is something that you could see around the world. The rise of nationalism in the Far East, in South Asia, in Europe. It's um, definitely something that is in the United States. It's something that is very palpable and it's... Um, it's understandable. I mean, you could talk all day about the the causes of it, but nevertheless, if you're an outsider, that's intimidating. Um, loneliness. The idea that you will be alone, that maybe you've had a difficult breakup with your boyfriend or girlfriend, or your husband or your wife, and that fear of loneliness, will I find someone else? It's quite scary. I've been single for quite a long time now, and as it stands, I'm okay with it. At this exact moment, I don't really need a girlfriend. I love women, but I don't need a girlfriend right now because it just adds complications to life. But I can definitely see I would want that in the near future. Um, and so much of this lockdown actually affects things, social life. You know, it's, it's maybe a good opportunity to reflect on all these things. Maybe it's a good opportunity for people to kind of tidy up their lives a little bit. It's not all a bad thing. But there are a lot of things in this world that can scare us. And what I'm doing with this video, I'm not trying to reiterate that for people with anxiety. I'm just trying to say that it's very, very important that we are in control of ourselves. Because being in control of ourselves doesn't mean that we're suddenly free from dangers. You could go out and get hit by a car, you know. Uh, if you live in a part of the world which is seismically active, you could die in an earthquake, you could die in a hurricane, you could die in floods. If you live in a non-stable country, um, a war zone, I mean, my goodness, I'm talking about fear and anxiety, I mentioned crime. Living in a war zone, I can't think of anything more terrifying than wondering, you know, are bombs going to come through your roof? It's um, And then the fear of the physical pain from being very seriously injured, or the emotional pain from losing loved ones. Those are things that nobody, that, that's that's just a nightmare for anyone to even conceive. And there are people in this world who go through that. The nightmare of starvation. Imagine being a child in Yemen. So there are evil things in this world. There's no point denying it, there are. But there is also great beauty in this world. I've always said, I, I don't think the world can be ever dismissed as in one sweeping manner. Like when I hear people say, they'll read a particularly unpleasant news report about a particular crime or something terrible, and they'll sort of think, oh, what's the world coming to? My response to that is, well, what's the world always been coming to? It's always on some level had good and bad. And I think for people with anxiety, it's important that they they focus on the good, but they don't totally ignore the bad, because I'm no expert. This is perhaps better for a psychologist to speculate on, but I would imagine someone with anxiety um, constantly going away from the things that might make them anxious may not necessarily help. I mean, um, it's a bit like a parent being overprotective. You know, that expression faces things that you fear. I don't think it should be taken literally. 
I mean, if you're frightened of war, you, you know, go to a war zone, you know. Um, but I, I think we just have to be our best selves. We have to give ourselves a break as well. Be our best selves, but also give ourselves a break. Don't be too hard on ourselves. And just try to be a decent human being. For me, it's not about... Um, and this is why I'm a little bit uneasy about religious dogma. Because, for example, with Christian teachings, it's always about... Um, you know, if you smoke, you're sinning. If you if you think lustful thoughts, you're sinning. But a lot of these are, I mean, if you're a heterosexual person, you're going to think about the opposite sex. Well, is that lust? Is it sinning? So that's where I find theological teachings can be problematic because they're too shackling. And that's why I've perhaps found it a little bit of a struggle to ever endorse organised religion. I'm not an atheist, but that's why I've never fully endorsed organized religion, because um, the dogma of it I find problematic. Um, I mean, Christians will say, I'm just using Christians as, as an example, will say they're always trying to be the best Christian they can be, but they never will be. And they know that. They'll always be flawed because they're human beings. So anyway, maybe I digress here from the main point. Actually, that actually brings in a relevant point. It's probably why a lot of people go to organise religion. Because they find it comforting. They find that all the hardships on earth, the poverty, the injustice, the unfairness, the persecution, all of it. Whatever miseries we go through on earth, from the faithful's point of view, if you're a decent human being and you believe, you'll go to the afterlife. Now, I would challenge any atheist to to not admit that as an incredibly, incredibly attractive concept. They may not believe it, they may think it's a fairy tale, but I would hope they at least concede it is a very attractive concept. So, even if, for me, and I don't want to go overly theological here, but for me that is comforting. And perhaps as one argument for faith, that it does give you that comfort that no matter what happens on this earth, let's say, um, let's say you are a person of faith and you find yourself in a war zone, you're kidnapped by terrorists and they torture you, or an authoritarian regime, you know, you get tortured by state police or something like that. Um, that's horrible. And you may well be um, on the verge of death. But then, for the faithful's point of view, and I'm not saying this in my opinion, but for their point of view, that is hellish, that's painful, but it's temporary. Paradise is eternal. So it's, um, I don't know, it's... I guess to unbelievers that's almost flippant. It's almost like trivialising things like that. But I would say it's just the way that some people have of looking at the evil things in this world. I mean, the things that people will do to other people, when you look at the psychology of serial killers, they're totally, totally desensitised to human beings. They, they see their victims as commodities. They don't see them as living, sentient beings. From a vegan's perspective, none of us see animals as sentient beings. We're all barbarians with the way we treat animals. So you could get really philosophical about rights and wrongs and you could get into a moral maze. You know that question, you know, if you find £10 in the ground, what do you do with it? I've always said, by the way, I would keep it because what, what do you do? You bring it to the police station, what would they do? They're not going to put out a note it's like, missing £10, turn up here. So, yeah, I would probably keep it if I found it on the ground. If it fell from someone's bag, I would definitely tell them. If it came from an ATM, I would inform the bank. But no, if I found it on the ground, speaking totally honestly, I would keep it. Because, it, I mean, if it rained or something, it would just get ruined anyway. So... 
That's what I would do. But it's one of those things, isn't it? Another one is the analogy where you have a group of people on, let's say, a lifeboat and the lifeboat's overflowing. And then you have all these different people. Lifeboat's one analogy. There's others. I think an airship was another one. Um, and the lifeboat's sinking. Um, who do you throw off to, to keep it afloat? And who's expendable? It's these moral questions. Parts of the world are clearly more dangerous than others. I mean, if you are in a country with low crime rates that isn't in a war zone, that has generally um, a fairly good human rights record, no one's perfect, but if it was, you know, a progressive modern country with a decent human rights record, that was politically stable, that had low crime rates, yeah, you could say, well, that's safe, that's good. But then what if we look and find that those countries, and I'm specifically not naming anywhere in particular, what if we find that there was other problems, like a high rate of depression? Depression is a complex thing. It comes from a whole range of reasons. So the truth of the matter is there will always, always be risk factors in this world. And what we have to do is try not to judge other people. It's very difficult, and I think it's something that we inevitably do to some extent. But try not to do it. Try to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Try to be our best selves. And, and believe in what you believe. I mean, I believe in justice. Think of crime because criminals hurt other people. Now, to me, alleviating that hurt is imposing justice. Sure, uh, rehabilitation is also important for that, but I just think that so many people are, no, I'll rephrase that. A lot of people don't give a lot of thought on I'll rephrase that. You see how I'm thinking with these things. It's just there's a lot of angles to look at. Yeah, I mean, there's people out there, right, who just don't, they don't care about other human beings. Uh, we can be angry with those people. We can feel resentful of them, understandably so. But it does make you wonder what sort of lives they have. They must have pretty shallow, unhappy lives if they feel the need to just be, um, I'm thinking of swearing because of the monetization. You know, if they feel the need to just shout insults at random strangers. I've encountered people like that. Mostly guys, and they think it's banter. You know, they think it's funny to just shout something at a stranger. And then if you stand up for yourself, they, they get aggro about it. Guys like that, I, um, of course, I'm resentful of them. I have no respect for them. But I also think there must be something missing in their lives. Um, so I would say it's important to be a little bit assertive in this world. It's not about being paranoid. It's not about getting into conspiracy theories. Incidentally, I think conspiracy theories, absolutely, if you have anxiety, do not buy into conspiracy theories. It'll only make your anxiety worse, especially since most of it is nonsense. But, and this is where we're culture dangerous because they hook people in. And we assume it's just naive, vulnerable people that are taken in by cults. Not necessarily. Um, it's just so, so important that people think for themselves and they're assertive. And they just, you know, deal with things cautiously. And give a little bit of thought into everything. It's not about overthinking. It's not about being paranoid. But it is important that we're aware of our surroundings. It is important that we just treat each unfortunate thing in its own on its own, I should say, rather than, I, I find that often depression builds up. I mean, in my case, that example I cited in late 2015, the, um, the depression built up because it was just one bad thing after another. And I was trying to, you know, see them as individual problems, but they did, they piled up. And it was just bad luck at that time. That is not normal. That doesn't always happen. It just happened to be at that time, a lot of things were piling up. How did I get out of that? Well, and some people may wonder about that. Um, I remember I put a post on Facebook, um, and frankly, it was sort of a cry for help. Um, and people reached out, you know, uh, I was almost overwhelmed by concern. 
I felt a little bit embarrassed about it, actually. Grateful, but also embarrassed. Because a lot of people were expressing their concern about something I'd said. I think it was something like, um, I can't take this anymore, or it was something along those lines. And um, I think we just have to not think, not let ourselves be defined by the past and not overthink the future. Just live each day. Try to make the most of each day. It sounds like a cliche, but it's a very valid one. It's a very, and this way, I think we were just saying that just by dealing with things day by day. Um, and obviously, you know, some people will have busier work schedules than others, but I, I do think this lockdown is a very good opportunity to reflect on ourselves and tidy our lives a little bit in some ways. For most people, I'm not saying this will be the case for everyone, but I think for a lot of people, it will just be an opportunity to reflect. So do it. You know, you're watching this video. Thank you if you've listened to me for 25 minutes. But um, I think that's the way to approach life. Just don't let individual problems, as stressful or as frustrating as they may be, get us down completely. So. Uh, you know, you get on a train, you miss your train, that's a big inconvenience, it's very stressful. But it's not the end of the world. Most things, most problems that we face in life are not the end of the world. They may mean temporary stress, they may mean some embarrassment, they may mean some anger. But most things, most things are not life-changing. We need to remember that. And even in war zones, I suppose the one, the one flicker of hope there is no war lasts forever. All wars at some point come to an end, whether for a peace accord, whether because the combating side just tire themselves out. Wars come to an end. And it's, um, it's of no consolation to people who suffered from them, but it's perhaps of a little more something to reflect on for people who have not directly suffered, but there may be, I don't know. Who, who am I to say that? I don't live in a war zone, but it's just a thought, really. Anyway, let me know your thoughts about fear and anxiety and how do you approach it. By the way, these, these people that say they never have fear or anxiety, they're lying through their teeth. I don't care how tough you are, every human being on earth has some degree of fear and, and, and anxiety. Some people, I'll just close with this, some people by nature of their profession have to be physically tough, they have to be brave, it, their job demands it. You know, if you're an SAS guy, you have to be physically brave and tough. It's a demand of the job. But even SAS guys are human beings. They at some point will have a cracking point. You know, they're among the best of the best in the world, but they, they're still human beings. They still have, you know, anger. They still have sadness. They still have all the sentiments that other human beings have. It's just they're in such a profession where it demands that they adapt in a certain way. Um, sports people, you know, a professional boxer, they have to be brave. It's, it's a demand of what they do. They have to be physically tough. It's a demand of what they do. Um, explorers, you know, have to be brave and physically tough. There's a lot of other examples. Frontline journalists, you know, reporting from a war zone, they have to be brave. Um, police officers, I would say right now, paramedics on the front line, knowing they can get this deadly virus knowing that 115 of their colleagues have died in this country. So there's a lot of people whose professions demand a degree of courage and physical toughness. Physical toughness can take the form of um, energy. I mean, being a world leader, prime ministers, presidents, they need to be physically tough enough to take the pressures that they do. So this uh, applies in a lot of different scopes. Okay, I will, I will round it up. Um, let me know your thoughts. How do you personally deal with fear or, or anxiety? Do you suffer anxiety? And if you do, um, how do you cope with it? I find, I mean, before the lockdown, going to a coffee shop generally really relaxed me. Sometimes reading a newspaper, burning incense. Um, nowadays, reading, having coffee and just reflecting a little bit. Meditation. Meditation, you know, doesn't mean doesn't have to be like sitting in a yoga position with a candle. It could just be simply a little bit of quiet reflection and letting yourself just feel calm. 
sapping out all the negativity for at least a few minutes. I think it's very healthy. Right, thanks for watching and let me know your thoughts.